Hi, I'm Frank Harmon, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw mine modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. One of the world's most recognized buildings, Two Towers now known by nearly everyone on the planet, was designed by an architect even devoted modernist fans have never heard of. He was even on the cover of Time magazine back in 1963. Today, we welcome author Dale Geyer, who wrote this architect's first comprehensive biography, Minoru Yamasaki, Humanist Architecture for a Modernist World. And now, someone who will never, ever be on the cover of Time Magazine, your host, George Smart. Out, Tom. That's so uh, harsh. I mean, U.S. Martinish Radio should get more cover stories. After all, this show influences literally dozens, I mean (laughs) dozens of people around the world each day. So, no to Time Magazine. How are my chances for, say, architecture record? Uh, let me check. No. Dwell? No way. Metropolis? <laughs> In your dreams. A progressive architecture? Well, sure, except that magazine's been extinct for 25 years, so no. Okay, how about a magazine that's in every doctor's office, highlights for children? <laughs> Maybe, but the editor's goofus and gallant. Well, they tend to like playing 50s brick ranches. It's going to be a tough sell, especially uh, since Goofus, I think he's still in rehab. <laughs> Well, there's one great magazine here in North Carolina that wrote up an incredible 60 pages about some of our favorite Tar Heel modernist architects, from Wilmington to Charlotte to Raleigh to Winston-Salem to Asheville. Here's a big shout out and thank you from the bottom of our little modernist hearts to Our State Magazine and their wonderful editor, Elizabeth Hudson. For the first time in decades, they gave huge recognition to what amazing modernist houses we have across North Carolina. The issue came out in March, and you can learn more or subscribe at www.ourstate.com. As my brain continues to fill with thousands of random bits of modernist trivia, I could not say six months ago who designed the World Trade Center in New York. It was Minoru Yamazaki, who was one of the towering figures of mid-century architecture. Yamazaki celebrated in iconic projects of the 1950s and 60s, included the St. Louis Airport, the Century Plaza Hotel in L.A., and the U.S. Science Pavilion in Seattle, all of which had enormous popular acclaim. He was huge, as well known as Bjarke Ingels or Frank Gehry is today, and right up there at the time at the top, with Philip Johnson and Edward Durrell Stone. We're going to learn a lot more about Yamazaki to Dale from Dale Geyer, a professor of architecture at Lawrence Technological University. He is a reviewer for the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, very serious, and the National Park Service. Not surprisingly, he is a member of the Yamazaki Advisory Board at Wayne State University. His first book, Frank Lloyd Wright's Florida Southern College, remains the only comprehensive history of Wright's largest and longest-lasting project. His most recent book about Yamazaki is the first to examine Yamazaki's work and life. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by modernist realtor Angela Roll. In our wonderful world of fantasy adventure, it is the year 2285, And Space Fleet Admiral Angela Roll is on a mission to test the modernist device, a technology which creates wildly popular Instagrammable worlds for posting throughout the cosmos. After she rejected Tatooine, too dry, Pluto, which never gets respect, and Pittsburgh, she beams down to a potential site and is captured by the architect Thelma Lou Kahn, who just escaped from a parallel dimension where bricks have fascinating conversations about their careers. Now, Khan is really upset that the modernist device will make architecture obsolete and attacks the food court on space station Gamma Alpha 3, where the device is undergoing testing by Admiral Roll's husband, Dr. Eric Von Roll, and her son Kaiser, who makes the bread at Subway. Khan 
Don angrily demands the modernist device and a tuna no cheese on nine grain honey wheat in exchange for the Roll's family safety. Will Admiral Roll escape? Wait for it. The Wrath of Khan? <laughs> Tune in next time, but for now, back in 2019, it's the Admiral's great, 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 great grandmother. Epic greatness. It's real estate agent Angela Roll, who protects the modernist universe. Specializing in modernist houses, Angela advises buyers and sellers on everything, from appropriate renovation to staging a martini party for 200 from 2,800 miles away. And that's actually true. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. Despite enormous success, Minoru Yamazaki's reputation declined in the 1970s with mixed reception of the World Trade Center in New York. One of the most publicized projects in the world at the time, and certainly now, and also the spectacular failure of the St. Louis Pruitt Igo Apartments, which showed major flaws in urban renewal policy. Author Dale Geyer is Associate Chair and Professor of Architecture at Lawrence Technological University. We are really glad to have him here because I am really curious about Minoru Yamazaki and his different projects and have become fascinated with this great new book that we have. So welcome, Dale. Oh, well, thank you for having me. A pleasure to be here. Before we get started... I was curious, what are your review for the National Park Service? That seems like an interesting job on your resume. Yeah, I get to review buildings and places that have been nominated for a National Historic Landmark status, which is the highest award that we give in the United States. There's kind of two levels at the National Park Service. There's the National Register of Historic Places for kind of everyday historic things. And then there's the National Historic Landmark uh, Program for the best and the most famous and the best examples of all. And so things like Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water and Independence Hall in Pennsylvania are on that list. And I've been privileged enough to help review some of the nominations for that. So we have you to thank for Falling Water being on that list? I, well, I wish. Oh, I take wish that the was on my time, but it was uh, <laughs> nominated way before me. So what's the difference between something on the National Register and a landmark? Well, technically, according to the National Park Service, it's sort of a level of importance. And in both cases, they're uh, just sort of status identifiers that can potentially give people breaks on their taxes if they own the property and refurbish it. But it really has to do with sort of level of importance. And so there are thousands and thousands of buildings on the National Register in the United States, and they're anything from, you know, everyday houses, old stores, drive-in theaters, anything that's over 50 years old, according to the National Park Service, is eligible to be historic and can be on the National Register. So that's sort of the vast majority of all the historic resources that we're interested in keeping as a society. And then the landmark is for the really special things. It's, it's intended to be a step up special recognition kind of thing for famous architects, really famous buildings and and places. Do people win something when they get this? Do they get like a toaster or a special certificate or some money or anything? (laughs) They get a special certificate. I would hope they would get a toaster or something nice, but it's probably just the recognition of a job well done. Well, that's pretty cool. Now, I also understand that before you got into architecture, you were a trial lawyer. I was, yes. Not many people make that jump. What led you to jump into the design field? Uh, That's a question I'm still trying to answer (laughs) many decades down the line, I think. (laughs) And my wife asks me that almost every week. Um, Which is more lucrative? Well, by far, it's more lucrative to be a trial attorney. And that's something that uh, my old friends remind me of every once in a while when I see them down in Florida. But I think I got bit by the architecture bug early, and it's sort of like an infection that took decades to appear. As I think back on it, um, when I was a kid, my father, who was a school principal, was an amateur constructor. He was constantly remodeling our house. So the entire time that I lived there as a kid, he was redoing rooms, he was adding rooms, he was building decks for swimming pools, fences for around the, the yard. So I saw this in action all the time, and and I think it, it got inside me, but I never really thought about it until I was an adult and I was an attorney practicing law. And I realized that I was living in Florida and I would visit Chicago and my family members uh, whenever possible. 
But I also realized that I was really thrilled about going into the city and seeing the buildings. Oh, yeah. And so at some point I decided to, I needed to learn something about how buildings were made, these kinds of things that are around us all the time. And so I started to read about how buildings were constructed, and I'm not really sure how, but I flipped into history at some point and got really, really interested in Frank Lloyd Wright and the rest is history. My friends all thought I was going to go into preservation law, which is a great field, but it it wasn't what I wanted to do. I, I was drawn to the history of architecture. I thought for about five minutes about being a designer and realized I didn't have the the skills or really the interest for it. it. I was more interested in the history and in learning about you know the changes in architecture over time based on materials and societal things and, and that sort of stuff. How long did it take for you to come up with that first book about Frank Lloyd Wright, about Florida Southern College? That was interesting because I actually, before I made the decision to switch careers, I thought I could do both a little bit. So ah. In my very little amount of free time as an attorney, I started to do research on Florida Southern College in Lakeland, Florida. I was living in Tampa at the time. It was an hour away. And uh, since I'd gotten really interested in Frank Lloyd Wright, and this was really it for him in Florida, I wanted to know more. And I found that there just wasn't anything out there that was satisfying me. There were bits and pieces of information here and there, but nobody had written a history, an architectural history of Wright's work there. So I started to do that when I was an attorney. It was a nights and weekends kind of thing. And, and the deeper I got into it, the more I just fell in love with it. And uh, at some point I, I crossed that line and decided to go ahead and make the jump and go back to school. And so I took the research that I'd already been using and, and turn that into my master's thesis on Florida Southern Smart College. move, yeah. And then uh, from there, it was just kind of a small step to turn that into a book uh, once I got out and was uh, teaching. Well, tell our listeners about Florida Southern College, because I think everyone would kind of guess, well, you know, sure, Frank Lloyd Wright did a building or two there, but this was something really special. Yeah, Frank, it was, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, it was the longest-lasting commission of his life. He began... Uh, the college contacted him around 1938 to begin negotiations. He died in 1959, and he was still designing buildings for the college, and they were still constructing buildings. So wow. over two decades, there's about 10 buildings or so, depending on how you count them. Uh, there's about a half a mile or more of covered walkways that connect the buildings. And it's really a great place to see Frank Lloyd Wright on a large scale. I mean, you really usually just get uh, one building by right. It's a house on a street somewhere. Sometimes you'll get a couple houses on a street, but they're not, you know, part of a, an organized scheme. This is a rare treat to really see uh, Wright's work on a large scale with different kinds of buildings. You know, he's got two chapels there, classroom buildings, administration buildings, science buildings. It's it's a really interesting mixture of a lot of the things that he was looking at in the 1930s and 40s. And it's also kind of, a, in terms of Wright's work itself, if you know him, uh, you may be familiar with his prairie-style work in the 1900s and 10s and the houses around uh, the Midwest. And then later on in the 40s and 50s, he becomes known for the Usonian kind of house and for bigger public projects like the Guggenheim Museum, for instance. But the the Florida Southern work is sort of the transition between those two modes. So it's some really interesting work that he did with the concrete blocks. And a number of years ago, at long last, they finally put in a visitor center down there. Yes. Yeah, it was interesting. When I started to go there in, I guess, it was the early 90s, there was almost no indication that Frank Lloyd Wright had an association with the campus. There was a really tiny sign on the highway that said, Frank Lloyd Wright's Florida Southern Campus, like next exit or something like that. But you could miss that very easily. And then when you got there, if you knew anything about the Wright buildings, you had to find them and you just wandered around and, and looked on your own. And so I think they realized that this was a problem. As more and more people were getting interested and more and more tourists were coming, uh, they decided a, a few years ago to build a visitor center, but also to build it as a not a reconstruction, as a construction of a proposed faculty house that Wright had designed for the campus, but was never built. 
So it's really kind of nice now when you go there. You've got a, an example of a, another building type that was supposed to be on campus but never made it. It's a nice place to organize your trip, and you, they have tours now that they uh, run out of there and, and literature that you can get. And so uh, they've got a handle on it, and it's a pretty good tourist experience. And I should say that Florida Southern's been doing a really good job of, of keeping up the buildings as well because they're kind of a preservation issue. Sometimes rights ideas were in advance of the industry's abilities to keep up with them. And so his concrete blocks have some problems. There's water that gets in between them and they're deteriorating. And so he it's was a constant struggle. On. Writing design checks that his materials couldn't cash? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's thank you, Tom. That's pretty it. elegant. Mm, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's move a bit west to Seattle, where okay. a young man named Yamazaki is born. Tell us about this great man and how he got into architecture. Minoru Yamazaki was born in Seattle, 1912. His parents were immigrants from Japan. As a kid, he showed real talent in mathematics and uh, did very, very well in school, but doesn't seem to have been any had any particular interest in architecture. We kind of know this because he wrote an autobiography in the 70s, which is really very, very interesting. But he said when he was in high school, he really didn't have any ideas about a career, but his mother's cousin came to visit, and he had just gotten his architecture degree from an American school and was headed back to Japan to practice. And uh, Yamasaki said that during that meeting when he saw the drawings and talked to his relatives, it, it really kind of clicked for him and he decided he wanted to be an architect. So he went to hometown school, the University of Washington, did wonderfully in his non-design classes, struggled to design, thought about changing to engineering, uh, but had a studio instructor who saw talent and helped him through, gave him some tips, and eventually uh, Yama became one of the best students in the program. Graduated from University of Washington in 1934, Great Depression is happening, so uh, there isn't a lot of job prospects out on the West Coast, and he, like a lot of people, headed to New York City to try to find some work. Uh, it's interesting when you think of Yamasaki, I guess, compared to Frank Lloyd Wright, who very famously, his mother decided before he was born that Wright would become an architect, and so she did everything she could to encourage that. Uh, Yamasaki's story contains none of that. That's amazing about Frank Lloyd Wright's mother. I did not ever hear that yeah. before. Yeah. Did she like she, uh, talking to him the in the womb? Is, <laughs> she, she talked to him in the womb. She <laughs> hung uh, images of Gothic cathedrals over his crib. Really? She, uh, yeah. She bought, um, there was a system created by German educator Friedrich Frabel of little materials, wooden blocks, uh, keys, string, all kinds of things, and you'd do these exercises with them, and it, it teaches you about form and, yeah. and shape and things, but I also ha- about space. I had Tinker and, Toys uh, when I was growing up. Yeah, yeah. These were like the precursors to Tinker Toys, oh. and Wright's mom bought some of those for him at a World's Fair in 1876, when they were brand new to the United States, took them home and experimented on young Frank. Well, what were the major projects he worked on then in the 40s? He moved to New York City in the early 30s and kicked around for a while, Uh, went to night class, taught night classes, spent his most reliable job for years was wrapping dishes for a dish company that were to be shipped overseas. But he was able to start working with a number of uh, big firms and important firms. So his first real job was with Shreve Lamb and Harmon, who had designed the Empire State Building just a few years before. He worked there for a few years, got some really important experience working on large apartment complexes in New York City area. And then when the war started in 1941, he was involved in and actually supervised the construction of a naval training center in upstate New York. So there are no buildings in New York or really anywhere that you can point to in the 40s and say, that's early Yamasaki. He worked on anonymous, large-scale projects, which taught him a lot about how to run a practice and how to deal with clients, Uh, but he just didn't get a whole lot of experience in terms of individual building design. 
He stayed with Shreve Lamb Harmon for about three years. Then he joined Fallu and Abramovitz, another very important big New York firm. Worked there for about a year. Uh, at this time, he was he'd become really good friends with George Nelson in New York. Oh, the City. famous designer. The famous designer, and for years, Nelson tried to get Yamasaki to start a firm with him in a partnership, and Yama always declined, but they did do work together. Uh, they redesigned some brownstones, they had some speculative projects, and in anticipation of them perhaps working as a firm together, Nelson talked Yamasaki into getting a job with a designer instead of an architecture firm. So Yamasaki worked for Raymond Lowy for about a year. And so are we talking about design of, like, furniture? Industrial or? design. Oh, oh. He did. Well, um, it's, yeah, I still am trying to track down and... some of that. Lowy's firm at that time had an architecture department because they were doing so much work, and, and it was so vast and different from an individual thing you hold in your hand to an entire building. Right. So I'm not sure how much real product design or industrial design Yama got in the office there. He may have just done architectural things, but it was, I think for Nelson, it was more just getting exposure to that kind of office and, and that kind of scale of design, which he hadn't had before. So how did Yamazaki make the transition to these big projects he did in St. Louis? So he's working at Raymond Lowy's firm in New York City. And he's contacted by Smith, Hinchman, and Grills in Detroit, which was most likely the largest firm in the country at that time. And they were looking for a lead designer. The firm had been around. It's, it's still around today. It's the Smith Group. And I think it is actually the longest continuously running architectural office in the country. They, they go back to the 1870s or even earlier. But they were huge, and they wanted to change direction. They were known for doing a kind of conservative design, but they wanted to go more modernist in, in the mid-40s. So in 1945, they sent someone out to recruit Yamasaki. And the great mystery to me is what was it about his anonymous work, really, with these firms that drew him and, and got their attention? And I still haven't been able to find out but what I do know is that he agreed, and he thought it might be interesting to live in Detroit for a few years. He packed up his family. They moved to Detroit in '45, and he stayed in the area for the rest of his life. In terms of how he got into the bigger commissions, he found that working with Smith Hinchman was very frustrating because even though he was supposedly the lead designer in the firm, the story is that they wouldn't let him have direct contact with the clients because he wasn't a partner. So every time he had he had an idea to change a design, he had to send it through a partner who would talk to the client and then translate it back to Yamasaki. And he thought this was ridiculous. And so after a few years, he had had enough. And he and two other employees, Joe Lineweber, who was a partner and was the oldest of the three, and George Helmuth decided to form their own firm. And to make it confusing... They opened two offices, one in Detroit and one in St. Louis, and they gave it two different names. Oh. So, yeah, and it took me a while to track this down. Uh, but in St. Louis, they were called Helmuth, Yamasaki, and Line Weber. And in Detroit, they were called Line Weber, Yamasaki, and Helmuth. <laughs> Was any of the pushback that he experienced earlier related to him being of Japanese ancestry? Absolutely. I'm thinking that, yeah, during the war. They were putting some of these people he, in internment camps. His parents narrowly avoided that. Okay. His, uh, his situation was, it's really, really interesting. And, and anyone listening, I would encourage you to try to find a copy of Yamasaki's book, A Life in Architecture, because I talk about it a little bit in my book, but he extensively talks about his youth. And it's really an interesting book. It's about half text and half just buildings, his favorite buildings. But out of the textual part, uh, about a third of that is about a couple summers he spent working in these Alaskan fishing canneries to try to make money to go to college. And it was just terrible, grueling, miserable work. And everybody there was some kind of immigrant. And it had a real effect on him. It was kind of the last straw, though, because he also talks in that book about slights and 
his mother teaching him to sort of ignore these sort of things, forgive it, turn your back on it, don't don't listen to it, because it happened so much. He writes about being banned from public places. Uh, he writes about people making comments to members of his family on the bus and all kinds of things like that. He moved to New York. It got a little bit better. Yeah. But this is when the war was coming out. Pearl Harbor happens December 7th, 1941. Within a week, his father was fired. His father had worked at a shoe store in Seattle for at least 20 years. He was fired, and they were on the list. His parents were on the list to go to an internment camp. But Yamasaki had an apartment in New York City. His brother was living with him. His brother was going to medical school at Columbia at the time. And Yama had just gotten married just before Pearl Harbor. So... I think that the apartment that was supposed to be for two suddenly had five people in it. <laughs> but in that way, he was able to save his parents from from the internment camp. So later on, he's in these two firms, well, he's the same firm with two different names, and his name is on the firm, on both of them. Yeah. So times must have changed at least a little bit for him. You know, it's the three guys, and he's the designer. Like, they can't really do much without him. Right. And uh, that's, I think, why they put him in the middle, and that's why he gets the name. The two projects that he was working on in St. Louis were the pruitt Igo public housing project and the St. Louis Airport, which was in reinventing itself for the 20th century. Both of these were really large projects. Yeah, it's an interesting breakdown between the work of the firm in the two cities. In Detroit, Lineweber, Yamasaki, and Helmuth focused on school buildings and houses, in St. Louis, where George Helmuth came from, they focused on bigger projects. They got a number of housing apartment projects. They won a commission to design a records storage facility for the U.S. government outside of St. Louis. And they got the airport commission. And I think a lot of this happens because of Helmuth's connections. Uh, George Helmuth had the father who was an architect in St. Louis and was well-connected and highly placed. And I think they tapped into those kinds of connections uh, when they opened their own firm. But, yeah, the airport was a big deal because it was the first generation of really interesting airports. You know, it was 1951. Air travel is just starting to get popular. But it's not really a big deal yet. And airport terminals are really very small, nondescript kinds of buildings. Quonset huts in some places. Well, you know, I think it was called Lambert Field. Back then. Lambert Field. Yeah. Yeah, and it was famous because Lindbergh had uh, yep. taken off from there and landed in Paris. And there were other experiments, too. It was Apparently, it's famous in the aeronautical history of the United States. But uh, Yama's idea was he wanted to make it like the Grand Central of air travel. And he'd lived in New York for 10 years. He loved Grand Central Station. And he felt like, you know, the next move in transportation is to the sky. And so we need to have an equivalent type of building for the airline terminal and not just a place where you sit and wait for a few minutes to walk out to your plane, but like something exciting. And he referenced Grand Central Station over and over again in terms of providing him with a model for a transportation building that, you know, is your first experience in the new city maybe, and it it should be a positive one. It, it does have that feel when thing. you fly in to the airport. It has these tall ceilings and these concrete arcs. I, the main building is still there. I know they're doing some mm-hmm. kind of renovation to the airport. Yeah, and it's uh, if you go there now, there are four big arches, and originally there were three. Uh, the fourth was added after Yama's time by HOK, which is George Helmuth's firm after the, the three partners broke up in the 1950s. Helmuth took with him Guy Obata, who was Yama's lead designer, and Obata kind of became the Yamasaki of HOK and did a lot of the great creative work. And he, I did not I know responsible that. responsible for adding that fourth stone. Yeah. Yeah, so some of the really interesting stuff that HOK did around St. Louis is Obata's work, and he was trained by Yamasaki. The airport itself was always considered a great success, but... The pruitt Igo project didn't quite work out. Tell us about that. Yeah, so what happens is that Yama and his firm are in the first wave of really big urban renewal in the United States in the early 50s. And so for people who don't know, this is a time when the United States government was giving huge amounts of money to cities across the country to tear down their old buildings, which were considered to be 
decrepit and, and dangerous, and to use that money to invest in new apartment buildings for people and highways and, and public amenities. And so all across the country, you get these massive apartment complexes being built based on information that had been generated over the previous 20 or 30 years, mostly coming out of Europe in terms of mass housing and and trying to make large-scale multi-unit housing more livable than it had been in the past. So Yama's in on this, and in St. Louis, they get three or four jobs to design fairly large apartment complexes. Pruitt Igo was only one of them, but it was the biggest in the city. And, uh, and it's it's massive. Con- it's a huge. It's massive. It's it, there was close to two thousand units, I think, in these buildings. They were ten stories tall. They were huge, long buildings. But that's not what he wanted. The story of Pruitt Igo is that Yamasaki had tried to design it as a mixture of tall buildings, like six or seven story apartment units with two story duplexes scattered around a site informally with lots of grass, maybe a little bit of stream traveling through playgrounds for the kids. It's going to be a really nice set of amenities for a group of people who had previously lived on the site and had decrepit uh, 19th century housing. What happens to Yamasaki and everyone who designs during this phase is that the government regulations squeeze the life out of these projects. They are required to cut corners and cut costs so much that all the really livable aspects of the design are squeezed out. So no more greenery, no more duplexes. Everything is the same massive, big 10 to 11-story tower. The money for the apartments themselves is cut, so they're, you know, they have to cut a room out. They don't get the, the space that they want for each room. It becomes and just it a, a being, horrible, horrible shell horrible. of its former vision. Right. And it, Brood Igo wasn't alone in that, but it gets scapegoated, and that's part of Yamasaki's problem, was that uh, later on down the line in the 1970s, St. Louis decided to begin to tear down Brood Igo, and they made a big... It took a long time to tear it down. There was a lot of publicity about it, and a number of people began to see it happening at other places around the country, and they began to talk about the failure of public housing, the failure of urban renewal, and they began to scapegoat some of the individuals. And that's what happened to Yamasaki. People began to point out all these problems with the design, and they said, it's the architect's fault. Uh, What they didn't know was that, you know, that is... His hands were tied. building was not what Yamasaki wanted, or any of these designers who had to run into this uh, situation. And there's a great documentary called The pruitt Igo Myth, yes. which chronicles all this. Exactly. And one of the things I learned from that movie was that while the government had the money to fund these things, and not really a whole lot to do it right, obviously, they had almost no money for the maintenance that was required to keep them up or staff them properly They wanted the local housing authority to run all that. And in many cases, the local housing authorities didn't have that kind of funding, so they couldn't fix things. Right. There were numerous problems in the design because of compromises. And then once the things were built, there was no money for maintenance. And Uh it wasn't just a St. Louis problem. It happened all over the country. And, And so even the best designed of these apartment complexes tended to wear down pretty quickly because there was nobody keeping them up. There was supposed to be a a community model in a lot of these buildings to where, you know, like we have today in downtowns, we have mixed use where you'd have Mm -hmm. little grocery stores or offices on the ground floor and housing up above. And that was totally eliminated for these. This was just warehousing of people, essentially. It does seem like the mixed use idea was part of his original concept, but what might have been one of the things that got stepped on by the government. It was. And what Yamasaki was trying to do, which a lot of architects in his position were trying to do with these apartment complexes, was to try to recreate the experience of the street up in the sky. And so Uh everything that you had down there, they were trying to bring up, whether it meant bringing little shops into the complex, you know, so people don't have to leave and walk a couple blocks to the store, anything. And for Yama, it meant mostly interactions among people. So there are two architectural innovations that he included in Pruitt-Igo that were successful. 
One was the skip-stop elevator, which doesn't stop at every floor, but I think in Prudigo stops every three floors. So you may have to walk up or down one floor, but that would be the most. And the idea was it saves time and money instead of having elevators that stop on every floor. But bigger than that was the gallery or the walkway. And we've all seen it by now. It's a, an apartment, and hotels are like this too sometimes, where the, there's just a, an outdoor walkway opening onto the individual units. So you could open your door and sit out on the gallery or corridor, whatever you want to call it. And it's like sitting out on your stoop or on the street or on the sidewalk. And you could talk to your friends. And the kids could play out there, and they were screened so the kids wouldn't fall. So that's one thing that Yama did that, the architectural commentators picked up on was this street in the sky notion, which everyone was trying to get to. It was felt that he'd done it pretty well under the circumstances at Pruitt Igo. But then again, you know, just allowing for interactions to happen with your neighbors does not make up for all the other problems with the complex that came out of the government regulations and the lack of funding. Now, by that time, by the time Pruitt Igo was destroyed, Yamazaki was already world famous for another two buildings in New York. Yes. In 1962, he was invited to prepare a proposal for the World Trade Center by the Port of New York Authority. And he was one of a small group of architects who responded. The Port Authority tried to get quite a large number of architects interested in the project, but it really came down to only a handful in the end. And Yamasaki was in the group, first of all, because he was famous. He'd appeared on the cover of Time magazine, or was about to, I'm sorry, appear on the cover of Time magazine. But more importantly, he'd done the U.S. Science Pavilion at the Seattle World's Fair in 1962. And a representative of the Port Authority saw that exhibit and thought it was wonderful. Reported back to his superiors and that's how Yamasaki kind of got in on the uh, World Trade Center's radar. So they invited him to submit a proposal. And his real competition for this was Philip Johnson and Walter Gropius. That's some big-time competition, yeah. That, that is some big-time competition. But if you think about who else was around, like Mies van der Rohe was still alive at that time. Frank Lloyd Wright had died recently, but Lou Kahn, was around. He wasn't quite the Lou Kahn that he would become, but he was on his way in terms of public recognition. Uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill were out there. Errol Sarnan had recently passed away, but there's still a lot of these famous designers that were there. I think a lot of them just weren't interested in the project. I think some of them, and, and this is all speculation because the Port Authority records were destroyed, unfortunately, but there seems to be some indication they thought that Mies might have been too old. They definitely thought Gropius was too old. He he may have been the finalist. It may have come down to Gropius's firm and Yamasaki's firm. And there are some records existing where the Port Authority is a little concerned about Gropius's age. They're more concerned about whether he's going to be personally responsible or whether he'd turn it over to his younger associates. Well, now, wait a second. In I mean, this, end, this is not some tiny little project. Why aren't architects climbing over themselves to get the commission? Uh, that's an interesting point. And I think some of it had to do with the size, maybe. Was it too big? I mean... Well, it's it's interesting that it wasn't announced originally as uh, the world's tallest building. But Port Authority didn't come out and say, we want the world's tallest buildings in New York. We're going to go out and get an architect to do it. They wanted a massive development in Manhattan, and they had some figures for how big it was going to be. But it wasn't the glory project to shoot for the tallest from the beginning. And so that might have factored into it as well. But this uh, was New York, story, you know, headquarters of tall buildings at that point. Well, here's another aspect that may have played into some people's decision, was the response that Yamasaki got for the World Trade Center. He found out that people loved the Empire State Building, and they were not that thrilled with something else going up in New York that would dwarf the Empire State Building and take attention away from it. And uh, maybe they avoided it for that reason, too. I don't know. There are a couple of things that came out of my research that I wasn't able to answer that really troubled me. One of them was why Smith Group hired him, and the other is the, the World Trade Center. 
and the fact that the bigger names weren't involved in it, which I found very, very surprising. When the original plans that Yamazaki did were announced to the public, the public really liked it. But later on, the mm-hmm. final plans, they weren't as crazy about it, right? Well, it's the public and the critics. You have to keep in mind that there are two different groups here, and I think what happened was the critics poisoned the public a little bit. It's really strange. One of the reasons they say they hire him is because they like, on the one hand, his engineering abilities, and he's working at the time on the IBM building in Seattle with the skilling engineering firm, which and they've developed a new type of way of making a tall building, which they would use in the World Trade Center. And that is to shift the load, the weight of the building, from a steel frame to the walls again, sort of an old-fashioned thing. Uh, It was a very high-tech kind of way to rethink tall buildings, and and Yama was involved with that. So the Port Authority people really liked that. But they also liked his ability to design for people, his plazas, his courtyards, his reflecting pools, his intimate little spaces that he liked to design for people to get away from the chaos of everyday life. So that's what they were expecting, I think. When he unveils the first designs in 1964, and it's just drawing in models at this point, everybody loves it. The public likes it. The critics like it. They think it's a really interesting solution. They really think the two towers are kind of a striking aesthetic piece of sculpture. Did the towers look like they did eventually, or were they different? Well, yeah, the towers are almost identical to what they would end up being in that first project. The plaza, though, was different. And the plaza contained a lot more trees. There was a moat, a a strip of water around the entire plaza that you had to cross to go into any building. And it was much more like his people spaces that he designed for his other small-scale work. So everybody was on board in 64. There are some more things that the Port Authority wanted out of the plaza and the building, which led to further adjustments. He unveiled the revisions in 66, and the real change was the plaza. He stripped it down, got rid of the trees, got rid of the moats. It essentially became what it was when it was built. Which was uh, and the critical, concrete pavement? It was concrete, uh, windswept, very open. There was a sculpture in the middle of it, but not much else. That was really the only major difference. But the critics started to tear into it. And it wasn't just the plaza that they tore into. Now they were sort of backtracking and saying, oh, the towers were too big. Oh, what a disaster it was that they tore down an entire thriving business district in Manhattan to create these buildings. Seems like people had, I don't know, pent-up hostility towards the project that they didn't let out in 64, but they let it out in 66. So there really wasn't any critics left who were favorable about the project after that. And I think it started to sour the public as well. And then when the towers start to go up and the public sees how big they are, I think for a lot of people that's a problem too because, as I said, they love the Empire State Building and and now there's a challenger on the horizon. Was this another case of the client value engineering the project back from what his original vision was? Not really. I think it was more a cost thing and maybe a battle of wills. I think one of the problems was the plaza was redundant because there was a whole subterranean world underneath it. Well, that's true. Yeah, a lot of it was what was below ground. Yeah. There were stores and restaurants. There were two different train lines that met there. And so there was a thriving underground world. And you didn't really need to go up to the plaza. Plus, the plaza was really open, and it was windy, and it was it was scaled to the buildings, and so it seemed kind of vast. But he fought for the plaza. I think he was really influenced by Rockefeller Center and was trying to do kind of his own version of that, in a way. But I think in the end, it was just sort of they didn't like some of the aspects of the plaza, And, of course, I'm speculating because we don't have the records, but maybe they didn't like the trees or the moats. Maybe they felt he was spending too much money on the plaza when there was this whole uh, underground area beneath it. I'm not sure, but it it seems from the accounts that remain that there were definite arguments going on, and there definitely was pressure from the Port Authority on Yama to make some changes. 
The critics were especially harsh on Yamazaki during this time. And yeah. they, they implied that Yamazaki was, in a sense, more decorator than architect, right? Ooh. Yes. The ones that wanted to, to really get to him would uh, lump him in with Philip, well, Philip Johnson, almost everybody criticized Philip Johnson back then, but he was a favorite. Paul Rudolph, for a while in his early days, was in there, and Edward Durrell Stone, along with Yamasaki. They were the decorators. If you wanted to attack modern architecture that you didn't like by those guys, and quite a few critics did, they would point out that they're not really doing architecture, they're just decorating or ornamenting boxes. That's the sort of thing modernism defeated, and we don't want it to come back. There was a lot of interesting things said about Yamasaki's work. In the book, I get into a little bit about how the the language is even gendered a little bit. So you get his work being described as frilly, pretty, <laughs> uh, yeah, all these adjectives that are That's... really demeaning, but also very pointedly feminine. When were the towers finished? When were they finally occupied? The towers were occupied, in, well, the building was dedicated in 73 uh-huh. in the spring, but it wasn't quite finished yet. I think maybe it was fully occupied by about 75. Okay. So that was a good, what, six or seven years of kvetching? Oh, Yeah. It was an ordeal. From 64 on, well, 66 on, I guess. It's at least a decade on this project Mm -hmm. of intense pressure. And it affected him. You know, in his personal life, uh, there were stories that he was drinking a little too much. He divorced his wife and went through a couple of other relationships. Eventually, he ended up back with his wife again uh, years later. But he seems to have sort of lost himself here during this phase as well. And it's really quite interesting that you know, he enters the World Trade Center on the cover of Time magazine. And by the time it's over, he is uh, one of the most disliked architects He's in America. He's down and out. Because yeah. the World Trade Center and the Pruitt-Igo thing is, is coming up at about the same time. So the 70s weren't good to Yamazaki. Although Yamazaki died in 1986, you were personally involved in saving his archives more recently. Yeah, I was fortunate that um, when I started to look into Yamasaki, and this was in uh, 2009, I was kind of the right place at the right time. I was about to teach a class. Actually, I'd started teaching a class on Detroit architecture. And I felt like I should teach Yamasaki a little bit more than I was, but I didn't know that much about him. I'd gone to architecture school and hadn't been taught about him. So that's an example of of where he was. So I started to teach myself a little bit about him. I went to a lecture at one of his synagogues that he designed in the area and met a couple of former employees. And at that point, I thought, well, I should talk to these guys and get their oral histories. And it wasn't about Yamasaki. It was about architecture in general. This whole generation of modernists from the 50s and 60s, you know, they're not all around anymore, and, and we need to capture their stories. So that got me interested in the first place. But within a month, I heard uh, for the grapevine that Yamasaki's office was closing down. I didn't even know it was still in existence. I found out where it was. I tried to contact some people because I was concerned about the records and the files. And I'm glad that I did because it turns out that the firm was closed down and it was seized by the government. And they were going to sell off everything to pay all these debts that the firm had. And they didn't really weren't going to discriminate about whether it was a chair or whether it was a drawing for the World Trade Center. So I notified everybody I could think of, and including folks at the Michigan State Historic Preservation Office, and they were able to get some materials together and went to the firm's office, saved as much as they could in early 2010. The story is that the shredding company was there too. Oh my goodness! And so these people would go through a drawer and identify what they wanted to try to keep. And whatever wasn't saved, the shredders took it, dumped it, and shredded it. That is just-in-time preservation. Yeah. Boy, timing is everything. So we were able to save a good deal of materials that have ended up at the archives of Michigan. And it was all office materials, so lots and lots of slides of models and images of drawings. And then within the, a year of that, the Yamasaki family donated their materials to the Wayne State Library here in Detroit, and that was just a treasure trove of really good stuff. They had 
or office correspondence, personal correspondence, scrapbooks, and all kinds of other materials that made the story full. So, you know, if I had started this five years earlier, or even a year earlier, I probably would have stopped due to a lack of information. Is there any memorial to Yamazaki anywhere in Michigan or at the World Trade Center? No. His grave is unmarked. Oh. Um, Where is yeah. it? It's. I, I'm pretty sure I know the cemetery. It's in a suburb of Detroit, in Troy, where he lived for a long, long time. It's interesting. When he moved to Detroit in 1945, he bought a house in the city, but then started to look out in the suburbs, Birmingham, Bluefield Hills, Gross Point, you know, where the auto executives live. Uh, and they wouldn't let him in. He couldn't get a house in any of those places. He ended up buying a farmhouse out in Troy, which is like 20 miles away from downtown Detroit. It was a decent area. It's where he wanted to live, and it wasn't a neighborhood that excluded him because of his ethnicity. Later on, when he was on the cover of Time magazine, he wasn't allowed to join the Birmingham Country Club. This is amazing. What a story. It's sad, yeah. except it's for the part where sad. you where you show up just in time to save his records. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Looking for a happy a ending moment. here, right? Right. Well, I think the happy ending is that people are learning more about him, and from yeah. the very beginning of this project, I recognized that even though he didn't really have a presence in the architectural world anymore, the public likes his work. And I always get a good response and have always gotten a good response from the public when I talk about his buildings and I go around the country and, and talk about the book. People just love his work. And the World Trade Center is far removed. Some people don't even associate him with it. And now if they do, the World Trade Center is, is viewed in a different light. Yes, it is. You know, it was one of the most vilified buildings of its time, and now it's on the list of Americans' most favorite buildings. And I want to say he did some really nice houses, too. He did. Personally, I'm a, uh, my specialty is schools. That's the real need of my work. And I can recognize that Yamasaki was a talented school designer, and he was well-respected in the school design community. But the houses he was doing at the same time, I think, are amazing. But he quit. He, he intentionally quit designing houses in the mid-'50s because he felt like it wasn't worth the investment, they took too much time. He wanted to do public buildings, and he didn't like the client looking over his shoulder and calling him up every day and, and discussing <laughs> changes. He said he never put a sign on any of his offices because he never wanted people to come in off the street and ask them to design a garage. Oh, no. Because those clients are always, always in your business. He wanted the big clients who would say, design a skyscraper, and then they'd step away from it. And let him do what he wanted. Those are the ideal clients, aren't they? Yes. Well, Dale, thanks so much for sharing this story with us. I hope that Yamazaki's legacy grows and grows and more people find out about him. I do, too. Thanks for having me. Minoru Yamazaki, Humanist Architecture for a Modernist World, is available anywhere fine books are sold. You can also read about Yamazaki's houses at our website, www.usmodernist.org. Yamazaki. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for modernist houses. 919-995-0550. Before we wrap things up, a special shout out from some of our great friends at Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. That would be Gilbert Gottfried and Frank Santo Padre. This is a really hilarious podcast series about old Hollywood and old TV that's been on now for, I think, 200 and some episodes. They have really helped out our show and giving technical advice, and they did a nice little promo for us that you'll hear. Gil, this next sponsor is going to turn you on like your Cesar Romero at a Florida citrus growers convention. What do you think of that? You like that analogy? Uh, yes, I, I, I attend those. <laughs> U.S. <laughs> All U.S. <the> time. <laughs> U.S. Modernist Radio is a podcast all about modernist architecture from our friend George Smart. He talks and laughs with fascinating guests who own, sell, create, love, and in some cases, hate the most controversial houses 
and buildings in the world. George chats with filmmakers, critics, architects, design fans, people like actress Kelly Lynch and Pulitzer Prize winner Paul Goldberger, Eric Lloyd Wright, landscape architect Susan Saarinen. You know these names, don't you, Gil? Oh, yes. And even... Who? Ah, and even... Groucho Marx therapist. Get out of here. The daughter-in-law of a guy named Rudolf Schindler. Yes, a famous architect. Now, personally, I've never heard of these people, but to architecture fans, they're a big deal. You'll love hearing George's interviews as he travels to design centers like New York, L.A., and Palm Springs. I actually had dinner with George recently, and he gave me Papillon Susu's phone number. But she's not responding to any of my voicemails. Wow, who paid for that dinner, by the way? Ah, uh, well, you know, I'm very generous. You know, I get this <laughs> reputation of being generous. <laughs> The show is U.S. Modernist Radio, available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Learn more at usmodernist.org. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 7,000 modernist houses by the most well-known mid-century architects out there, and access 2.5 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Guest researcher Cindy Stratton, not her real name, an enigma to some and feared by others. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. Goofus and I will be back soon with another edition of U.S. Modernist Radio.